It's hard for a rose to grow from concrete because there's no soil. I want to be that rose that stayed there and built a garden in the concrete. Low riding has a huge misconception. A lot of people associate it with gang violence and drugs and drug dealers or whatnot, but you know, it, it, it's not a rap video. I take pride in my car. You know, my family name is behind this car. My daughters and my wife are on this car. And uh, there's nothing that I would do to mess that up. I have a 1936 Chevy Standard four-door with suicide doors. The body is candy magenta and the fenders are also candy magenta with a little bit of metal flake on it. I've got some pinstripe and some silver leafing with candy on top of it. I don't have too many accessories. I'd say the only accessory I have are the visor and a custom grill. I just wanted to give it just that extra touch. The engine, I have a 235 that I took out of a 1955 Chevy. It's rebuilt. I decided to candy it, paint it the color of the car. And in the trunk, I have two Pesco 280s. They're also known as the, the Screaming Mimis. They were used in World War II bombers. It's a very unique hydraulic setup where what we use as oil tanks now used to be used as oxygen tanks in these bombers for the pilots. So they're separate from the hydraulic pump itself. The pump itself is candied like the car and everything else is chromed out. There's nothing that's stock in my interior. New door panels, my rear seat is customized. My two front seats are out of a 1995 Lexus. Originally on these cars, the bench seat is a little close to the steering wheel. I, I just wasn't comfortable. And I needed something a little bit more relaxed for me. So that's why I decided on the tilt steering column with the custom steering wheel. Both of the seats were powered, so I drive with my seat as far back as I can get it, and it's real comfortable. The interior is like a cream vinyl with suede inserts and a little bit of stainless steel touches on it. I have custom gauges. I'm rolling on 13-inch Zenith 72 spokes. The spokes are candied on 520s. So I named my car Linda Chicana. I really thought about it because the name has to flow with the car, you know? And one day we're at my dad's house listening to some music, hanging out, and this song by, uh, by Chunky and Los Alacanes came on called Linda Chicana, where they talk about a Chicana overcoming everything bad in her life. No matter what she's gone through, and she will always persevere. And I was like, damn, Linda Chicana, that's a cool name. I have murals only on the inside of the car. I have Aztec work, Mayan work, uh, a little bit of Toltec designs on there for uh, the murals. At first, I only had my daughter on there, and then in the trunk, I got my wife on there, and my four-year-old, when she was about two years old, you know, I, I got her mural on there. So now, I have my, my three lindas chicanas on the car. So I was born and raised in South San Diego in the community of Del Sol. I come from a family of five. I have an older brother who's a year and a half older than I am and a sister who's five years younger than I am. My parents divorced when I was 20, 21 years old, and um, I didn't really know how to take it. It was a little rough time, you know, emotionally, but I eventually, you know, got out of that. My father was born in San Diego, mainly raised in Tijuana. My grandparents wanted him to have an education here in the United States because financially, this is where the money's at. So, so he'd go from elementary school to elementary school and he never found a home for school. So he dropped out and he started working and he started a, a business with his compadre and then, so now he's a subcontractor for a recycling company. My mom was born in Tijuana and moved to where my grandmother was from. It's this little pueblito in Nayarit, the town of El Rosario. And they moved back there when my mom was, I think, five or six years old because her father left the family. My mom went through so much growing up, you know, not having the dad. She had a mom, but the mom was over here 
trying to do what she could to bring her family to the United States. And eventually she did. My mom started school here in seventh grade, learned English real quick. You know, her thing was like, man, I watch I Love Lucy all the time. You know, and that's how she learned English, you know, that and really, really trying her hardest, giving it 100%. She worked for Lucky's. She worked for that company since she was 16 years old. She recently retired, so she, I believe she worked for 42 years for that company. I mean, my, my mother was a great mother. There, there's no complaints, but there are um, baseball games that I wish she attended. You know, she'd miss going to birthday parties with us. I don't hold that against her at all because she was doing what she was doing to, to, to raise our family, but she did miss a lot. To me, they're successful people. You know, both my parents taught me, you have to give it 100%. You have to know who you are. You have to know where you came from. Know your parents' story, know your grandparents' story. If you can know your great-grandparents' story, even better. But you have to know your roots, right? They're like, you have to know who you are. You have to carry your name with pride. You know, everything that you do, whether it's good or bad, it's gonna reflect on us, on your grandparents, and on your great-grandparents. Straight out of high school, I didn't know that I wanted to become a teacher. I knew I wanted to work with teens, and I knew I wanted to help teens. I just didn't know how. I had a great connection with two teachers, you know, Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Arriaga. They're like, when you're ready, when you finish college, you're gonna start subbing for us. And when you finish your teaching credential, we're gonna hook you up with a job right here. I got my teaching credential, and you know, there was a, a vacancy. So I started subbing, and I wanna say within two weeks, they were like, all right, man, we're gonna send you to the district if you want this job. And I ended up working at the high school where I graduated. So I teach high school history at Southwest High School in South San Diego. So I teach social sciences, which is in ninth grade, you have geography, 10th grade, world history, then you have U.S. history, and then the seniors, government and economics. So I teach the, the, all of those. Classes. There is a lot of misconceptions of teachers too, you know, a, a lot of people think they're just there for the paycheck. It's easy money. Oh man, you're on vacation all the time. We hear all that negative stuff, you know, but I, I, I wish people gave us more of a chance. I wish people would visit schools more, you know, I always encourage my parents like, man, come in. Come in, see how I teach your kids. I, I don't want to just call you when your kid's in trouble. I want you to come see how I teach. I want you to laugh with me and my students, you know, because that's part of how I teach. You know, I, I love cracking jokes. There, there's never a dull moment, whether it's me or my students, you know? Like, it's tough being a teenager with all the peer pressure, with social media, with all the stuff that's going on, that mental illness, it, it's tough being a teen. You know, you see a lot of kids and it's hard to make personal connections, personal relationships with these kids which is what I wanted to do. And that's what led me to be a teacher. If I could have one-to-one -one contact with kids every day for that whole school year, then to me, I was gonna make a bigger impact that way. These kids, they, they go through so much. I mean, they're almost like your children, you know? They come in, they, you see their face, and I'm like, what's going on, mijo? What's going on, mijo? And then they'll just, they'll just spill it all out, you know? The hardest part about my job is not bringing my work home with me. It can get emotional. I mean, a lot of the times my wife, she's the kindergarten teacher, and that's what we talk about. And giving each other advice, like, what should I do with this kid? What should I tell this kid with what they're going through? Just because I'm so attached to, to these kids. There's so many different things that I love about low writing. It is therapeutic. You know, I could be having a, a bad day and uh, my little one, my four-year-old, Daddy, are we gonna cruise the pink Impala? She thinks every lowrider is an Impala. You know, Dad, can we take the pink Impala to church? For me, that's the beauty in it. Being able to put my family in my car, go for a cruise, listen to some music. You know, my wife and I kind of touch elbows when we're bumping some oldies or some old school and my girls are like in the back just jamming. You know, I'm like, see, this is, this is beautiful. I knew that down the road I wanted to have a little family. A lot of the times what I had observed after college when I started teaching, you know, just talking to coworkers where they live, and they live in the fancier neighborhoods. 
because to them, they quote unquote made it, you know? And I was like, well, I think I made it too. We decided to stay in the community where I grew up in. For me, it was just kind of to show people that like, you can go to college, you can have a profession, and you can still live in the neighborhood. I want to represent my neighborhood in a positive way. For me, it's trying to get people who are successful to stay in those communities. I want to be that rose that stayed there and built a garden in the concrete. My name is Juan Manuel Carrillo. I'm a high school history teacher, and I'm a lowrider role model.